Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Righteous Responders Podcast. I'm your humbled host, Joe Locus. It's uh, again mid-December, and it is in the evening. And today's a special episode, episode number eight. Uh, I'm not going to title it just yet because we have uh, one of our uh, one of my sisters, someone you may know from our social media posts, Brandy Perchinski. She is a police officer out of Pennsylvania and also uh, on our peer support team for the um, organization that I have called First Responders PTSD Connection, uh, PTSD.help. The organization is uh, a nonprofit that I started several years ago after my own struggle with PTSD and not, not being able to get assistance like I needed to. And I began sharing online, and, and it morphed into starting the organization. And um, I've been blessed enough that people have uh, reached out and wanted to be a part of that. And Brandy is officially uh, part of the organization. So we're just going to have a conversation. This is not uh, scripted, guys. You know that. Uh, if you're listening, you already know most of my situation, my story. But maybe you do not know Brandy. So... Yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna have a conversation. So, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you. So it's uh, it's mid December, and let's start with the most obvious: the weather. <laughs> so I'm in Florida, Southwest Florida. You're in Pennsylvania. Give me a quick uh, uh, synopsis here. Let's just say the highway shut down. Come to my mm. house, and we're getting 18 inches of snow. So we're stuck. <laughs> oh my god! You, you have snow on the ground now. Oh, yeah. We have, I think, probably about five, six inches or more. Wow. So two to three an hour. So we'll see. And, and in law enforcement, as I mentioned, for those that don't know, uh, you you being a police officer, uh, you get you don't have to go into work when it snows, right? Is that yeah. Right? No, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. No chains on the tires or anything like that? No, I wish. We have snow tires on, but that's about it. Yeah. And yeah. What, do you, what do you drive in, in the inclement or what do you drive for your patrol car? Just a sedan, Ford Interceptor. I love yeah. it. It's all black. Yeah. That's what I like to drive. Nice. We have. Uh, we just got a Tahoe, nice Tahoe. Yeah. It's small and smaller Tahoes. No, it's a big one. It's like a big Tahoe. Oh. Nice leather, Bluetooth. I won't touch it. I like nice. my. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had a Tahoe in my personal life, and I fell in love with it. But you know, I got out right when um, the. Uh, explorers were not right when they were coming out but right when like the whole region or the whole country started adapting those from the crown vix so i never got the experience to uh chase or do anything in those how do they handle the explorers we have one it does good i i mean listen my sedan that thing books i mean yeah. I black beauty i've chased some people down in that you know and sometimes when i don't drive it like when another officer will come in and I see them creeping in the alley. I'm thinking it's a person and it's a cop. It's my partner in wow. my car. So it's so discreet, you know what I mean? And Hello. is it is it unmarked? Uh, no, it marked? Marked, but our, our graphics are so dark with the car. I love that. You know I love what I mean? That. It's like a blue black, so it blends with the car real nice. And yeah, I love it. It's my you girl. guys, it, I can always tell a lot about a department and their chief if if uh, by the colors of the vehicle, especially when they switch them up. And with that blue black, when did you guys go to that? Do you know? We had it. Had that it since you've been there. Yeah, it's the only black car. All the other ones, we have a white unmarked, which is the Tahoe, and then we have the Explorer, and that's all marked up. But I yeah. just I like the black car, so it's yeah. my preference. Well, with this weather, I guess it probably and it's not four wheel drive, right? Yeah, it is. That's oh, it is. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The tires on it for me, and wow. So yeah, I you know for those that don't know, I started my career up north. So the two years that I was in New York, it was like, you get used to, you know, when you're born and raised up in New York or up North, you're used to the snow. So whether you had a front wheel drive or a, 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 you know, four by four, you do get adjusted to it. But now it's like being in Florida. I haven't seen snow in so long. Forget the uniform stuff. I wouldn't know how to drive in it at all. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so. I'll some because it's <laughs> yeah, I said to come trade just for like a week. Yeah, you come around to Florida. I'll go up because I haven't been sledding. When my daughter was, I think, 
I think she was six when we went sledding last time. So it's been, you know, literally like 17 years since I've been in the snow. That's insane. Yeah. And you've got a 18 coming. Great. Wonderful. Yeah. So yeah. very cool. Well, um, I wanted to talk about your personal, um, your personal journey yeah. uh, in getting into law enforcement and, um, you know, what, what got you into law enforcement? Well, like, I, you know, summer, you know, you don't have to, it, I mean, I'll sum it up pretty much when I was like, I don't know, seventh grade, eighth grade, the BTK killer when he got caught was on TV. And that was the first like big thing that happened. Right. Obviously it wasn't in my area, but I was like, what is it? What is this? And what is that? And I just started researching stuff. And in high school, our whole high school career, I call it, we had to choose a job and study it. And then that was our graduation project was to choose that job. And I chose first, it was like uh, being a forensic psychologist, but I realized this was more my alley too. Like it's, I like all things law enforcement related, right. but I had a really shitty childhood. My kid, you know, my parents were in and out of prison all the time, abuse in the house, yeah. drugs in the house. So when I was like 13, 14, a cop who, you know, I knew my whole life from coming to my house kind of stepped in and he's like, you know, if you want to go down the path that your parents are going down, you need to straighten up. Cause I was running the streets because my parents weren't home ever. You know what I mean? So I was out doing, I was 13, but I was 18. You know, I had to get a job right, right. under the table. Um, so when I turned 18, I'm sorry, when I turned 17, I enlisted in the military because my parents weren't around. So I had to pay for college to be a state trooper here. You have to have an associate's degree. And I became in the military and I got discharged because I injured my knee on duty there. And I went and pursued my associates and I got accepted to the state police. But at the time I had all these tattoos from the military. Oh no. Yeah. At the time it was in 2013 when I got accepted and did all my testing and I had to go for a physical and they had the tattoo, like a body chart. And if you had any tattoos and that's where you had to either remove them or you couldn't enlist. Like, what? Yeah, they just changed it this year that they'll accept your tattoos, but you have to kind of go through a like a screening phase, kind of like yeah, a, for your right? yeah I had like yeah. Two when I joined the service. So when he went to MAPS, they screened them all, made sure they weren't gang affiliated, stuff like that. But once I realized I couldn't be a state cop, I'm like, well, sh can I swear on here? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. You're I was good. like, shit. No, 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 you're totally, totally fine. Well, and then, you know, I became a single mom. Then I pushed more college, you know, um, because. And how old are you at that point? I was 21. Right. And I had my yeah. daughter. And then I took a break and worked my ass off because I was a full-time college student, single mother. Wow. I had to work two jobs. And then when the academy finally reopened here, because it closed down for a while, I, uh, I was like, I got to do it. So, you know, I joined the academy. I got hired in the academy, and here I am on the streets. Like the week I graduated, I started my job. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Now, now, is it there in in a lot of jurisdictions they have where you go through a program through the community college or BLET or wherever, whatever law enforcement training? Did you, did you get hired before you went on, or you went through training and then got hired? So I rode along. We did ride alongs. And um, then I was on F, you know, I rode along, got to know the guys and stuff. And then literally my first ride along that I was a graduate at the Academy, I had a vest on and that was it. I didn't have any of my, um, you know, no gun or anything yet. Right, right. I had a freaking foot chase. <laughs> oh my God. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. But my partner, <laughs> my partner's like, get in the car. You don't have anything. And the girl was <laughs> The girl had a bat and was threatening to kill this lady. He was chasing her down the street. Wow. So ever since then, they call me the pit bull because I'm like, let me out, let me out. And they just open the door and there I go. <laughs> right, right. I was on an FTO program. So they grade you. You have sheets, yeah. records, you know, um, all that stuff. So I did two FTO programs because I'm, I'm still employed at both departments that I was hired at. Um, so I got to go through two totally different FTOs, you know, the training, the departments, it's, it's weird. You have to flip a switch on and off when you go to each one because they're totally opposite. We're in the Whoa. same time, but they run totally different. This is the same time frame? Yeah. Wow. So you had to rip. Wow. That's interesting. Two different department policies at the same time as well. Yeah. I mean, everything from your reporting system to how you log your evidence to how you do your criminal complaints to just everything. Are you kidding. 
Yeah, so it's a lot, but I mean, I, and I actually worked, I picked up, because I'm part, I was part-time, I'm still part-time. So I was, I picked up uh, another part-time job and then I worked at the DUI processing center. So what we have here in like Cumming County is if you get a drunk driver, you drop them off at a center with two, um, un, like they're in plain clothes police officers because you need them to read the DL-26 form for our license suspensions and stuff. Right. You just drop them off, fill paperwork out, and they do your DUI processing for you. They find them a ride, and you just go right back out on the street. So, oh, wow, that makes it nice. It so I went there at nighttime when my kids slept because it's a good interviewing experience. You know, you get to kind of try to tone down their DUIs because they get pretty aggressive. You know, they're getting a DUI. I mean, right, some right. That, it's a bad situation. So, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. So you're, so now you're, if you're training for both jobs, you get in, mm -hmm. and as you said, you're like the pit bull. So you, you got right in after it. Yeah. Um, and you're so you're a single mom at this time. Mm -hmm. Did um did you have any help with your how was it what a son or daughter at the time? I both, yeah. So there was a private daycare um, woman that we had. So when I got to the academy, I was married already. Sorry, let me just backtrack here. I met my husband that I'm no longer with now, but he worked all day like a normal job right so i had a lady care for my kids while i was gone even at the academy i mean she opened up early for me oh, and wow. i would pick them up after the academy and i'd wake up and do it every day for eight months i mean just i drove an hour commute to and from wow so hour commute every day so yeah i was, wow. it was an awesome, yeah it was an awesome experience though so. <laughs> yeah i bet yeah that has that has to be hard as well though i think for a lot of us that when we got into it, having a family network around to kind of keep you grounded because you're going into a whole different realm of life and left you and especially for those like you and I, I mean, I had like you, I had a interesting childhood. Um, I had a lot of love in the house, but it was very dysfunctional as far right. as divorces and chaos and things when that you and I both had discussed when we were children just things that, you know, things happen in our lives, but, um, to come from that and to get into law enforcement and you're yeah. thrown into this, you know, this whole new realm of like the legal system and, and basically having to solve everyone's problems. Right. And, you know, so the training you do, you know, the eight months or whatever yours was, uh, you get out of the Academy, you go through field training and you're still in training and then all of a sudden you're out on the street by yourself solving, mm -hmm. you know, at 21, 22 years old with kids at home yeah. and trying to solve the world's problems in mm -hmm. your community. Yeah. So for you, um, what was it? Uh, what was your favorite as far as getting in? What was the what's your favorite thing to do or in in law enforcement? Do you have a specific uh, thing. Yeah. Drug, yeah. Addiction. drug addiction. You That's do. Fun. Yeah. I'm doing right now. Um, I'm doing a lot of it. Every every shift, I'm getting a drugs, you know, good stop. Wow. Um, really into that. I mean, I both departments. Like I'm so swamped in paperwork. I just got it wasn't a lot, but 65 bundles of fentanyl off of a consent a consent search to a car because of just reading body language. I've been studying books um, on my own time. Wow. And I have we're I'm part of a drug interdiction team. I uh, just became part of that about three months ago. And I've been having guys teach me, you know, ways to search the car correctly. I now carry a Phillips head screwdriver in my pocket. <laughs> right. You know. Uh, right. And have and to I, get into air AC vents and all that good stuff. Yeah. We're going to so take. Yeah. That's my favorite thing. I mean, I'm I'm always gonna. I love the detective stuff too, right? Because yeah. what's great about working in these small departments is that you get to lead your own investigation. You don't hand oh, it yeah. to somebody yeah. else. You, you know, do you do everything. Right. Go to court. You know, go to everything. I mean, right. some departments, you, the sergeant goes to traffic court for you, so they don't have to call you in for overtime, but we do it all here. I mean, you get to experience a lot of it, and I think it's good because you get to know the judges, you get to know the court yeah. process. You do. Stuff like that. Yeah, I think uh, I've learned a lot. I, I've worked for a huge agency and then a smaller agency, uh, and, of course, being on a task force where you worked with multiple agencies, and... I got to tell you, the smaller departments, the workload is insane. Yeah. But if you really are trying to 
And most of us, we get into this field, maybe we have a goal and our goal is to become a police officer. But a lot of people also want to go federal or they want to go to like a huge agency. And having that on your resume where you've done ever where you do everything and you handle everything and you can have those one in one relationships with the DAs and like you said, the judges. Yeah. Uh, it can it can be a huge thing for your career. Um if you know, of course, and what we're gonna get into next is the the stresses of the job, but um is there uh is there anything like that you didn't realize like what was the big shock of getting into police work that you didn't realize before getting into it something uh, you wish you maybe had known that we wear more than one hat <laughs> you're not just to copy me <laughs> people don't understand that they don't understand that you know we i mean i don't even know where to begin but we do so many different things and and my problem is in the academies and this is i'm not saying this about every academy but they don't stress mental health, right? They don't mm -hmm. stress these EVPs, if that's the correct way to, you know, that changes all the time, politically correct. Right, right. People. But you, I've seen it, robotic comps, right? Let me write yep. the traffic ticket, here you go. They don't go beyond the stop. They don't do any of that. And these are the comps that are responding to these certain calls that are being robotic when someone's having a manic episode. You can't have that. Mm -hmm. You cannot have that on those calls. You need some sort of humanizing behind the badge. And that's true. And that's why I'm out on the street, even doing drug interdiction. Like the guy I just had, I'm talking to him just like I'm talking to you. Even yeah. though it's 65 bundles of fentanyl, he was going to go deliver and probably kill people. Yeah. It's a lot of fentanyl, by the way. You said 65 bundles. Like, yeah. like it wasn't that much. That's a lot of fentanyl. It doesn't look a lot, right? When you get it, but you're like, uh -uh. but it's a lot. Yeah. And it's a lot of money in each of them bags. So, yeah. but I, you got to treat people, you know, we're all human. We all, we just do a different job and we all go through shit, no matter if we're a cop, no matter if we're a teacher, right. you know what I mean? They can't be going out there treating people like shit because they did something. They made a mistake. Now I'm not saying that about everything, but I'm saying you still got to talk to them like a human, especially when you deal with mental health people. Cause they think we can't relate. We're the bad guy. We're the badge. We're there yeah. to do all this stuff. Yeah. You go to their level. And I know they say you should never go to their level, but once you say, listen, I've struggled myself. And then you look at them and stuff. They'll, they'll, they'll know if you're not, if you're bullshitting them or not. I, I'm, I gotta say whoever said that is mistaken because you and I are on the same page when it comes to, first of all, treating people decently or like human beings, like you'd want to be treated. Right. I always went into that that way. But if you don't get to that, if you don't go down to that level, as far as on the understanding side, then you're then this you're not going to go anywhere in this job as a matter of fact you're going to get you're going to be burned out day two because i find that when you can go to their level and have that conversation like the only reason i'll, I'll be honest i'm not saying i wasn't a good detective for other reasons but one of the things that made me great at investigations was my cis and getting getting info on the down low from people in, on the street. Yep. And the reason I got that, just like for you and your drug interdiction, is I didn't treat because mental health and drug addiction to me are one and the same. And I'm not going to treat that person like they're a piece of shit because, in my opinion, they're not. They're just maybe uh, there's some science to the fact that that substance abuse is uh, an actual uh, imbalance issue where there's something else going on scientifically or physically with your system that, that, that puts you in that situation uh, or at more risk more than others. But when you go on their level, you'll not only learn more about what crime you're investigating or, or helping resolve whatever emergency they're going through, but you're going to learn everything about yourself. Absolutely. Everything. I try, so, you know, I tell these guys, I'm like, I don't know why you do what you do. But if it's because something happened, no, um, nine times out of 10, it's something that happened in their childhood. I hear it time and time again. Oh, my cousin died. So I got so drunk and then I started doing this and then right. get over a death or something. And I'm like, listen, you can't, they just, they can't cope with reality. But right. think about it, a lot of us can't either. So what do cops do? They drink. 
They go out and have drinks. They go home and they drink. I can't tell you how many officers I know that once they leave shift, they go sit at the bar. That's what they do. Yeah. There's a reason for that, right? But they don't, they're just like, well, I just like to have a couple of drinks. This is an everyday thing, every weekend thing. You know, there's a reason you're doing that. One day you're going to know and it's not going to be good, but they don't yeah. want to hear that. They don't believe that, you know, because alcohol is downplayed, right? It's just a yeah occasional thing they do, but it's actually all the time. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like a drug to me. It's like absolutely nicotine and caffeine, like the things that are legal that you're allowed to do as an 18 or plus 21 plus. Um, but talk about addicting and life altering, uh, especially alcohol. It's a gateway drug, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a, it's it, it is. accessible, and you go to the bar, yeah. and what do people do? They do cocaine when they drink. So then you yeah. get on that, or you know, you get introduced to a bigger crowd of people, older people that have been doing stuff for a while. You know what I mean? Right. No, I do. And that's just my opinion. Um, but I also grew up with in an alcoholic household, and it well, led. Yes. Yeah, right, things. and you know exactly what happens. Yeah, I'm dealing with it right now with a family member. Um, and you know that I lost my brother to an opiate overdose. So yeah. I'm very, uh, I should be angry and should hate it. Right. But I, I love the sayings like hate the sin, not the sinner. Yep. Um, you know, I had my own personal issues, uh, when I got off the job after, after an injury, I, I see, I can see all sides of it, but you basically answered that question because the biggest thing that and I'm going to agree with you because the biggest thing that neither of us realized when we got into this line of work is, is my question was, is that the mental health part and not just responding to mental health calls, but the actual, uh, why I started the organization or why you and I are actually having this conversation right now. Right. So, um, if you can, and whatever you're comfortable with sharing, um, do you mind if we talk about your PTSD? Go ahead. No, I, t I try and relate to people more than other with that. So I, I'm, I've been talking about it more than ever. <laughs> right. Dealing with yeah. a lot of people, so. and, and I didn't, but I'm, you're so much further ahead as far as the on the job understanding where you're at with PTSD than I was even, you know, several years after when I was trying to figure out what was wrong with me, even though I knew, um, when did you first notice that you were um, you were having any type of issues what, related to PTSD? And for those that don't know, post traumatic stress disorder. When I was locking myself in the police department, <laughs> I was typing reports, and I was like, we have blinds and stuff above our, and I always keep them open because I want to see who's pulling in and out of the police department. But I was locking myself in there. I didn't want to leave. Cause I thought someone was pacing outside the door. I constantly check outside. Um, I hear people in the office. I go outside. Like we have a gas pump. We don't go to the one department. We have a, like a municipal building. We get gas at, I couldn't even go there. Cause I thought someone was out there. Um, when I wasn't sleeping, when I was after the incident that started this, we'll say awakening of PTSD. I went home that day, like an hour after, not even an hour. I left the hospital and went right home to my children and they wanted to go for a walk. And I swore I heard a car accident, a woman screaming. So I was frantic, right? Going in back in cop mode, trying to help somebody who didn't even exist. There was nothing. There was nothing. there. <laughs> so I was like, whoa, what's going on? Then I started, you know, I went to work. I'm like, well, maybe I'm just worked up from what happened. But then it consistently happened like for three days. My car was parked and my chief noticed because our cars are tracked, like where we go, how much time we spend somewhere um, in case, you know, people are doing bad stuff on the job because it happens. Right. Or something happens, right? Yeah. He noticed I was at, because I'm, I'm always right. out. I never sit in the office, but I was sitting in the office. And then when my partner came in, who I consider like a father figure, he's a detective, retired homicide detective. He just works here part time to help us out. He was like, you look horrible. Like, no offense. Like, what are you sleeping? Like, I looked like a crackhead because I was so, I didn't realize the hallucinating at home and hallucinating at work. I thought it was just my nerves. You know, oh. I was just, it was, it was bad. And then that's when I called you because I was like, listen, no one's helping me. What do I do? I don't know what to do. I have no idea what this is. Did you, um, 
and I want to say this because uh, there's people that are going to be listening to this that are that don't understand how those of us in law enforcement could be struggling like that with um, what we obviously found out to be PTSD. But did you? Um, so this was how long from the first day till the till how long was that from the first time you noticed or from the first incident where you started you know seeing those things till the day that you talked to me i think it was three months <laughs> it was three months okay yeah so for three months you were going back and forth trying to figure out what was going on trying to take care of things and you know yeah. figure out and you like me and know and we're not going to share any names but you did try to contact a couple other places to see if you could get some assistance yes and you know part of the problem yeah no call back nothing nope nothing <laughs> yeah and and we're not going to name the names because i've mentioned this before that the reason i started the organization uh so in a way i'm going to thank them because uh I was really desperate when I reached out for help to the point where, I mean, I wasn't even employed anymore and I was hit the worst I could be and I couldn't get callbacks. So me starting the organization was a way to say, I'm not going to let that shit happen to anyone else. And it so is. When you, yeah. And when you contacted me, you know, um, it, it, like I said, I just, I've always followed my gut. And I believe that everything happens for a reason, including the shit that we went through as children and um, uh, becoming police officers and the things that we see at work and then how we interact with people. Because we're both obviously empathic that way that we uh, the whole going down to the other person's level, you're you're really it's not it, you're just trying to understand where they're at. But we did understand where they were at. Because right. we face things in our personal lives and, and watching family members go through things. So your that three months of you back and forth was did it all did it at any point did it dawn on you that that the job was causing it but before you had asked and started really figuring out and getting help? I'm trying to think about that. I know I have two people that I talk to like my, my best friends. Listen, I don't have many girlfriends. <laughs> I don't get along with women too well, <laughs> but two of them are just like me. They're like 40 years old. They're my best friends. And when I started telling them what happened, I called one when I got the call of the incident that I knew was going to fuck me up because right. it was the worst fear. And it, it happened. And I was like, how the hell am I going to do this? You know, she, you know, after I kept talking about it and not sleeping, they were checking me like, you really need to, consult do you ever think that you might have ptsd i was like oh, i don't have that i said no i'm good i said i'm good but you know what i was drinking i don't drink i go to the gym every day oh, wow. i drink every day i started smoking cigarettes i don't even do that stuff like wow. i was so out there but i didn't even know it right i was so out there and then when i kept having those you know and in the middle of this i went through a divorce because my spouse at the time <clears throat> you know, was insane and so, um, you broke out. He thought he what? Out, he told me I was oh, okay because yeah, I was that, waking yeah. up, going outside, thinking the police were there because I would hear sirens and I was waiting for them and they weren't coming. Nobody was coming, but I swore, you know. Um, so, you know, in the middle of all this mental breakdown, I was getting a divorce and it's probably the best thing that's ever happened, honestly, but uh, just so much. And then once I start, obviously I listened to another podcast that sheds light on PTSD and law enforcement and stuff like that. So I was like, holy shit, that's me, man, all day long. Mm -hmm. like, that's me. What do I do? And then, like you said, I reached out to who they recommend, who they preach about. Yeah. I didn't get anything. And that's why I was so frantic when I called you. I sound, probably sounded like I was on meth when I called you because I was way out there. <sighs> You actually were well, very, I've spoken to a couple dozen people in the last however many months and you were very composed, but that's the cop thing in you where right. when you're talking to another brother and you're kind of hiding it, a, not on purpose. You're just, that's, you don't want to come off in a certain way, but you sounded, I could tell, you know, but that's because of me, but I wouldn't have known had you not said that that was going on. Yeah, you have that that pit bull that 
that part of you, that go getter, um, we used to call it full of piss and vinegar. Yeah. You know, when you get out, yeah. I mean, so I was always getting into shit and always stuff would find me. I'd be like, pull over a car and I'd get a weird feeling and something was wrong and there'd be freaking a kilo in the glove box or whatever, you know, uh, a finger in the, in the middle console. Don't, we'll talk about that one one time. But, um, and it wasn't attached, no. But it's, uh, it's interesting because even though you, so, the three month time span, people do not understand when it comes to us that we we do because our job is to help other people in their emergencies. When it comes to our own emergency or our own struggles in life, and, and obviously, I've said this to you personally, but I think that divorce played a, a bigger role in the beginning because you're already stressed out, you're already going to work feeling vulnerable or having issues at home. That's why, again, the mental health part that's never talked about is that when you're, it's almost like we were predisposed in a certain, in a sense, right. You know, cause I was going through stuff at home and then, and then once I get at work, you're a little bit more sensitive and then you end up in a shootout or whatever it is. And then it starts adding up, but you reaching out was the bravest fucking thing excuse my language sorry but, yeah no yeah i know it's my own <laughs> yeah. heart but really i i'd never been and again i've talked to plenty a lot of people but the way you said it and the way you and i talked i could tell you were going to be a sister for life but i could also tell that you were that you there's just something about you that you were meant to find this out in your career at an earlier time. Because right. if you'd have went five years, 10 years, you know, I went, I made it over 10, but I'd already had, was going through PTSD kind of new, but again, we don't want to acknowledge it. Right. Um, but that time, if you, I just worry, if you hadn't reached out, I don't, I just can't imagine where you had been, but let's, explain why you're ha you can have this conversation today what was it that you so everyone knows the organization but it took you reaching out and you taking those next steps that we discussed yeah to make anything happen right because you could freaking you know you can reach out to someone God forbid they don't call you back but you could reach out and then never follow through and then just suck it up but yeah. what what was it you decided you were going to push through and, and actually follow through and get help? Well, because I knew I had a problem. I mean, I, I was like, I, I got to stop this shit. How am I going to go to work? I can't even go to work and function, you know? Right. And that's, that's my life besides my life, you know, besides my home life. Yeah. Um, and I'm very thankful, and it sucks for cops that are 20 years retired and or you know, did 20 years and are going through this now because this, your podcast, the podcast I listened to your organization, other organizations, they weren't around. Social media wasn't around. No. Very fortunate to have that influence to constantly remind me like, Hey, listen over here, this may happen to you and, right. we're here, and explain it and have other officers come on and talk about it. But I just listened to what you said because you've done it. You said, just listen, you just try this. And we'll, if that doesn't work, we'll try that. But the things we tried worked and, and therapy is one of them. And it's not that I ever knocked therapy, but I told my therapist, I said, you know, people that go to therapy that I know, they're always upset. Like they're crying all the time when they leave therapy. Right. That's what's going to happen here. She's like, no, that's not what's going to happen. They just, it's like practice what you preach. We're unpaid therapists all day long, but we don't take our own advice. Ever. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. We are. I mean, it ha and I do it for people that I know. They're constantly on me like, oh, I'm having this issue, blah, blah, blah. But then why am I letting my shit get like that? If I'm telling you what to do, I should be telling myself that. And that's a problem I think a lot of people have, especially because we're stubborn, right? We yeah. don't need help. We don't need this. But there's a reason cops are killing themselves. Mm -hmm. There's a reason that cops are doing things on the job, excessive uses of force and other things, because they're so... They're like us. I, I say it's like a sponge. You can dump water on it so long before that shit starts leaking out. You got to yeah, yeah. wring it out. And if, yeah. in the, 
you know, my whole childhood was never rung out. Then the cop stuff and just right. other things that happened. I mean, imagine a guy 25 years on the job that's just dealt with a lot of shit and he's just stone cold all the time. Like <laughs> it's somebody you're going to have to worry about when they retire because there's always demons, man. And everybody has them. And that's what they don't understand. You know, it's just all on who recognizes them first and deals with them right. before it's too late. Yeah. You, you have brilliant points because first of all, um, the, and I'm not going to say it's, there's, it's not predominantly um, men. Um, maybe I just haven't, me personally, I haven't dealt with as many um, female police officers that go through it. And I'll probably get slack for saying that you guys are a little bit tougher in the sense that you, I don't know, you take, you take on so much, you know, uh, females or women in police in policing, you have to work a bunch around a bunch of, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, a bunch of dudes, who, yeah. you know, for whatever reason or, or the way they are. And like you mentioned, drinking and smoking and next thing you are as well. Um, but the, but and I know that they didn't have that in the past because I didn't have that training coming up when I started in the late nineties. But there, um, there's there's so many of these men and women, mostly men, who get out of police work after those twenty plus years or ten or whatever happens, and they live like a year or two, and. Um, what impressed me about you, which we'll get into as well is your health. Obviously you work out every day. Yeah. You're a specimen and, uh, I wouldn't mess with you on the street, <laughs> but seriously, like you take care of yourself, but you also have to take care of yourself mentally. Right. So imagine these guys out here and you know, we work with them who not only are in bad shape, because they don't take care of themselves. They don't practice anything they preach at all. Yeah. God forbid you got to get into a foot chase and, and go more than 20 yards. You're out of breath. Someone's mm -hmm. going to tackle you, get your gun, whatever. But uh, And then they get out. They got heart you know, heart disease, hypertension. Uh, the stress of the job is killing them, literally, uh, within a couple years of getting off the job. And now we have a chance to change all that. But it's going to take people like you and I having this conversation yep. because it wasn't there before and people like you that it takes guts to be an active police officer and and have this conversation do you know how rare that is yeah you know i personally know that you have an amazing department and um who are very supportive of you and have worked with you going through this process but if you again if you hadn't taken that step to get help whether it was through me or, or through the organization or anywhere else, I don't know where you would be. And I don't know where I would be if I hadn't gone through the same person you went to, you know what right. I mean? So it's okay. like, um, not to keep circling back to that, but that, that thing that you wish you'd have known getting into this career. So what do you think, what do you think needs to happen besides what you've addressed with, uh, these these officers going out on the street and being so stressed out, there's more uses of force, which I believe that wholeheartedly. Yeah. The the stress, they're not taking care of themselves. But the training, what do you think, would, in your opinion, would be a minimum amount of mental health PTSD training prior to even hitting the street? Listen, it's going to sound bad. But if I could take my body camera footage in there of the shit I've been through already and show them this is what you're going to be exposed to. You know, this is the raw, real instances that you're going to get. You know, we all get 911 dispatch calls. It's never what it is when we get there, right? No. You never know what you're going to find or what you're going to deal with when you get there. But they need to, I think, and I've talked to you about this, Ernie and Joe crisis cops. I think they're great. That HBO movie they did, but they go around to academies saying, listen, and they talk about their suicidal ideations they've had. Yeah. Um, their mental health. Listen, you know, I was you sitting in that chair, you know, at the academy thinking I'm this tough cop and I'm hearing these stories about cops going through stuff and that's not going to be me. Well, you're naive for thinking that. And that's absolutely right. true. Nobody thinks it's going to trauma doesn't pick who right. it picks. Right. Cancer doesn't pick right. who it, it just does it, right? It doesn't care at all. Trauma, trauma yeah. is the 
same way in other and what people don't understand. And this is what I didn't understand. I told you about this is I I'm a veteran, but I'm not like a combat, like overseas combat. Right. right. How do I just des- not deserve those people need to help more than I do. That's how I would think like, oh, I never fought in combat, never gotten a shootout, never did this. Why am I going through that? But trauma is trauma and other people, our brains just take it that way. And that's the yep. science behind PTSD. It could be somebody watching a friend overdose. That can yep. be their PTSD in that person forever. Anxiety, stuff like that. I mean, there's just so much that's not said about it. And right. more or less, they, it's more veteran, you know, veterans suffer and they are suffering. Like I'm trying to help one right now and he's out of control <laughs> and I don't right. know what to do, you know, but yeah, you mentioned that before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I, I just think they should talk about it more. If they would let me go in, I'd go in and talk about it all day. <laughs> and I talk about it on the street. I mean, I just had this conversation with a woman. I took my vest off. I have an outer carrier, and I've never, ever done that in my career. And I put it in my car, and I sat on the sidewalk and hugged her while she sobbed because her boyfriend OD'd. He was OD'd in the house when I found him. And she couldn't take it, you know, and they're both – both drug users, drug sellers, but I still am a person and I still understand that. And right. for me, that robotic cop and you know what I mean? It's, it's hard. Yeah. I guess you had to be there. I'm sure people will think, well, that's not the safest thing she could have done, but that was the right thing to do at the time. It, you know, I had other officers there, but my job was to make sure that she wasn't going and seeing him bent over naked face down on the floor. Cause he was sitting on the toilet, he shoved drugs up his ass dead. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And she found him. And, you know, for her to keep going in there and looking at him, nobody likes that. I don't know why people are so fascinated with dead bodies. Can someone explain that to me? Yeah. Like, Did you ever see one? What'd you do? It's like yeah. uh, I called the corner and I loaded the body up in the body. Right. I had to watch him, you know, watch a dead guy for an hour. They're like, oh, isn't that so cool? It's like, no, True. it's not. Oh, it's God. not cool. Like, was that a kindergarten you're asking you? No, I'm telling you, people are like, oh, how many dead bodies have you saw? Like, it's a competition. It, I don't want to see that shit, man. <laughs> That's, you know, but guess what we do? Um, but yeah, people, I don't really know how to explain it, man, but oh, I think I'm, it's a like car crash it. syndrome. Yeah, they need yeah. to definitely educate people more. And I think the best way to do it is to show camera footage because people are like, oh, you really went through that? And then, you know, camera footage would be released or the, the criminal complaint in the paper. They're like, how'd you deal with that? It's like, I don't know. I'm trying to deal with it. <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Right. I, I'm trying to. Um, but I think that the raw information, no bullshit. Right. Thrown in these kids' faces. Because half of them are kids. are like 21, you know, going right. through the academy. Right. They realize that stuff. In and the, the very stuff. beginning of training. Yeah, because they're going to go on duty and then you tell them that and they can see an officer. Like, say their FTL is that guy, right? And they could potentially right. kill them from eating their gun one day. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I agree 100%. I think that uh, training is – look, we, we, we go through academies for a reason. And we don't really learn what being an officer is until you get out on the street. But yeah. it's to build that foundation up, so that way we have a good grasp on on the on every little facet. But you don't learn until you're out there on the street doing it. But in the back of your head, you want that information there, just like when I, you know, like you're trying to learn the ten codes or signals or whatever. Yeah. And you know, I want to be able to be on a call, and when I'm finished with that call, go okay, that was a pretty stressful event. You know, do I need to uh, decompress? Is this something that's going to catch up to me later? I think there needs to be something in place. But I also think there to take away the stigma because it's so bad that that I, I hate saying this, but uh, these officers are out committing suicide before they rather acknowledge they're hurting. It's like that tough guy. You know, I'm a warrior. Yes, you're a warrior. But you're holding this shit in until it explodes and it's ruining everyone around you, whether you know it or not. Yeah. I think there needs to be mandatory in-service training. Just like we don't do enough use of force stuff at all. We should be at least have some sort of jujitsu or something. But that's a whole other thing. But without training and me being mandatory, because then there's no stigma because you got to go. You have to go. Just like a, 
a post shooting like i went to a post shooting uh psychological review after i got a shooting i had to go and see the and you know you have so many days or weeks or whatever for me it was very short that you're uh not on desk duty per se but you're at a, a lower you're not on patrol they are not going to put you on patrol the day, you know, the week after your shooting. You have to get evaluated and everything else. These are simple things, but the stigma is the biggest thing. Right. If you're afraid to come forward and talk to me or you're afraid to go to your department and tell them, which we have to understand as well. Here's part of the problem. And you know this, uh, except that you, you, like I said, your department's been amazing as far as that goes if you acknowledge a mental health injury in our line of work it has to be done very sensitively like as far as like i'd rather have you walk right into the office and say look i'm having issues i need time off than hiding it and then you know what i mean because you're yeah. afraid they're going to take your gun and badge away which does happen but what's mo what's more important at this point your right. suicide your kids finding you you know, if you don't give a, give a crap at all, think about the officers that have to respond to your call. Right. Because I've had to respond to a, a retired officer who committed suicide, and that hit like hit home. Right. And I was seeing these plaques on the wall and stuff, and I'm like, wow, it's like an officer down call. But you're like, but what? You know, but no one knew. He didn't share it. All he was doing was drinking. Mm -hmm. There's that that hidden thing they do. So, yes. I agree. I agree. Where you are in your um, in your process now with your PTSD, it's been how it's been several months. Yeah, it's been right? about six, I think. Right, six months. Yeah, and uh, you don't have to share too many details. Obviously, you um, were able to get some help and got you in touch with uh, the person that I um, that helped me. And that's been helpful to you. What, uh, what are you doing now? What's your, because obviously it's an ongoing thing. This isn't something you're going to, there's the other thing about PTSD. People think it's, you're going to go into counseling for a week or yeah. take a Zoloft or Xanax or whatever, and you're back and everything's fine. It doesn't work that way. Because I think they're unpacking, like with me, all that, you had mentioned it, your childhood stuff, mm -hmm. divorce stuff, all the trauma in between, and the on-duty stuff. Yeah. It takes years to unpack that stuff. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's my opinion. So, what, where are you at with your, um, your treatment and your, um, back on duty and stuff? Yeah. I think I'm doing, I would, my spouse could tell you more, but from, he met me, I got a divorce and it was, he, my husband was cheating on me with this woman for like eight months, whatever, while I was at work. And then I went through my episode. But my spouse, who I have now, was a support friend. And he watched me go through it all. So he seen me in the beginning, right. before, beginning, and, at, and right now. And he's like, I think you're doing great. But he can see it on my face if something's going on. Like, it's right. it's like a dog that alerts to something, man. Yeah, he yeah. Knows. Um, I went back to work. What was I off? Two months, two and a half months. That was hard. So you did take time off. But I needed it. Don't know. Yeah, I needed it, um, I guess. But I felt better going back in. Uh, I haven't had, I've had the nightmares more or less now than anything. Like I just had a bunch the other night. Like every time I fell asleep, I woke up because I thought I was in a pursuit or I thought yeah. I was doing this or that or this or that. And I wasn't, but I had a, I guess a breakthrough you could call. I hasn't, I haven't grieved since this incident, even though it was so upsetting to me. Right. Which you would think, well, Jesus, if it bothered her that much and if she was so sad about it or upset, why don't she cry? I'm just not that person. But through yeah. therapy, I've learned that you have to do that. Mm -hmm. I actually was at a, a a bar, I guess, a club, and I had a lady outside. They came and got me because they knew I was a cop. She's crying. She got beat up in a in an area that I right next to the area I work in. And anyway, with talking with her and stuff like that, I had to call her a ride. She didn't want to be reported because the area I was at, the police there, they don't really do their job. They could care less. Like there's one cop. For however many people and he just doesn't do anything right well i was talking with her and stuff and i don't even know what happened but she said you know i lost my goddaughter and i was like okay 
you know, is that something, is that why you're so upset right now? Cause you're under the influence and it's coming back. She's like, well, I'm sure you know who she was. And then she said the name and that was, Oh my God. That was the dead baby I had. Right. Wow. So I'm like, shit, here we go. <laughs> so I said, actually, that was my, my case. And I said, uh, I was there, you know, the whole time. And I think the, the mother got, you know, finally what she deserved. And she started crying and hugging me. She's like, thank you so much for being a person. She was like disclosing things about the case that I didn't even know. Like I was there, the baby died. She was high. She was laying in the crib for five hours. Whoa. And this is stuff I suspected because of the child's state when I discovered the child, right? You know? And uh, so I cried with this total stranger in the parking lot hugging her. Like, what? You know? But that was the first time I even grieved over the incident, I guess you can say. And I, I went back to my spouse once she got a ride and stuff. And I, I wiped my face because, listen, if I ever cried, it was in the shower. And if it, I cried, it was when, like, someone died. Like, it doesn't happen. Right. I went to go back inside. He's like, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. But he could see it. And he's like, come here. And then I just cried for, like, 30 seconds. I said, clean my face, please, before I go back. <laughs> but that was it. It was oh. that done deal for me, but that was the first time I've ever done that yet. And I think even when she got charged, like with what she was supposed to, I wish she would have got more, but it was tough to do that. It was a really hard situation to do the certain charges. But anyway, I was excited, but I didn't cry. Why didn't I cry? You know, I should be crying tears of joy, I should be happy, but I, my body couldn't do it because I was yeah. so I don't know. I, I don't know. My head wasn't in the right space. I mean, it's getting there, but it's tough. <laughs> it's really tough. I, I think that, uh, that I think that is a breakthrough in a lot of ways. I think as long as you, um, like, and again, I don't want people to, every case is every case. Well, I call it a case, but Every single one of us is different in the way that we deal with trauma and how PTSD interacts with us. Obviously, I'm not a physician. I'm not anything I tell you is not uh, or, or Brandy tells you we're not physicians. We can't diagnose you or anything, but we can only tell you from our experience um, what it's been like and what we're going through or what she's going through. And, you know, it's like for me, like it took me several years of that one-on-one -on -one kind of treatment, right? right? And I tried other actual treatments, the EDMR, and um, there's several things I tried. And of course, medications, but you have to learn. And again, not to scare anyone, but this is a long process Yeah. because just like with my, my 10 plus years, each incident added up for me. And that's every single incident that happened, but each one that made an impact on me that I set aside and ignored yep. added up. So it was a cumulative issue. So that's why I mind see PTSD for cumulative because each major case that stuck with me, like yours, with the child, children, domestics, all that stuff like that. And then for the, at the very end, my shooting, that's what that was basically like the icing on the cake. Yeah. So that many years of that building up, it takes you, in my opinion, it's like a double thing. So then it's that many years of getting you into something on a routine basis of, and whether it's having this conversation, because I think personally, I'm not saying you don't need treatment or people don't need treatment, but even having this conversation is, is a form of treatment. Absolutely. Like yeah. sharing our stories, me sharing online before I even started the organization was so healing for me because I was this guy, like the guys that you worked with that didn't, I was full of piss and vinegar, a shit magnet. I always thought I was the, t like I had to be tough. You know, my FTOs were carrying billy clubs still and still carrying them around on the call and kind of like hitting their hand. Oh. Like, hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on. This is legit. This is legit. So it's just, oh. but they would be on a call like this. No. And then we're talking, you know, early to before 9 11. And I'm going to these, these field training officers that were like, they'd look at me and go, Locus, 
you're an 800 pound gorilla. Nobody can take you out. Like you have to tell yourself in your head, Mm -hmm. you're going to fight to the death. No one can take you on. Don't let anyone punk you out. They didn't mention a word about, Hey, this 800 pound gorilla is like an infant. If you do not work on these traumas in your life. And I hadn't worked on my childhood stuff anyway. So it's like, it all added up for me. And looking back, um, the stigma is what caught me because I wasn't going to tell the officers I was working with. I was petrified. They were my brothers and sisters. Like, you know, but you notice as well for anyone who's been in law enforcement or fire service or whatever, and they get out. Once you're out, you're out. There's yeah. no more cookouts. There's no more your buddies call you up. Hey, uh, we're going to get together for a birthday or whatever. After like a couple years, you slowly start even getting calls. Right. So in the end of all of this, no matter what, it's about you and your fight and your journey. And if you don't reach out and ask for help or or in the very beginning, that's what you did. So you're, you're what I call a, a rare person because most people they won't acknowledge it three months is pretty is pretty amazing as far as you know instead of like three years and then finally like 12 divorces later right. suicidal ideation and then right. you're like okay i think i have a problem you know you're you're taking drugs or whatever but yeah i i think it's so important that your story and our stories get out there in the universe and um what's the one the the best advice you would give to someone a, a young man or woman who's listening to this who fall upon this conversation uh who wants to get into police work sheriff deputy whatever and uh what would you tell them what's your best advice for the mental health side not a hundred other advice but you know what i mean yeah i mean don't you can't be afraid to do your job right people are like well, aren't you afraid to go into those situations if i was i couldn't do this job it's like leaving your bias in the car that's what i try and do right um but you're a human you are a human being with emotions and things are going to affect you just because you wear a badge and a gun every day doesn't mean you're steel <laughs> right it's not and if you feel anything any certain way if something bothers you that you saw you need to talk about it no matter if it's a dead body or uh someone that burned alive in a car i just had a fatal accident with brain all over the the ground right this is this was just a couple weeks ago and my spouse is like are you okay i said i'm good you know but thanks i appreciate that but you're gonna see stuff and it's not gonna bother you then because it doesn't like mine for instance i mean i had a bunch of incidents leading up to that but that was like the worst fear in law enforcement right right I'm a mother and yeah, like, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but you can't, if something's bothering you, you have to, there's gotta be one person you can talk to. And that's what I was going to tell you. The three months time span, I think was so short because my partner that I have now, my drug and addiction partner, um, I went to the Academy with him. He's my best friend. We talk, you know, through, we didn't work together until this past year and we're permanent partners. And now we're doing this interdiction stuff. But he heard the call that I was on and he knew that it was going to kill me because as soon as I went available from my call and said, you know, um, I'm available, I'm out of service. So-and-so is going to come in this unit. He called me on my way home. Wow. He's like, Brandy, listen, are you okay? And he's like, I don't want to be that guy. He goes, it's taken like four hours for me not to call you because I was on that scene for a while. Wow. He's like, I know this and that and this and that. You need to call me. You need to call me. So I would call him every day. And he would call me, how are you doing? But once I started telling him I was hallucinating, he's like, Brandy, you really need to think about not going to work for a minute. Like, just take a break. He goes, God forbid you go to a call while you're going through this stuff and you hallucinate on the job in front of people. Mm-hmm. Or you need to use your gun. You need to use your tape. Something. He goes, that can come back and get you. And I was like, oh, I'm fine. I'm not fine. I'm not fine. I was not fine at all. You know? Yeah. But he pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And obviously then it, it didn't get any better. It just kept getting worse. Um, but I guess my advice would be don't be afraid to talk about it, but they are afraid to talk about it. But yeah, when, once you talk about it though, I'm not shitting you. It's like people come out of the woodwork in law enforcement. They're like, yeah. Hey, I heard, you know, 
so-and-so said this and it's like, listen, I really don't care if you know why I was off for two months. Are you okay? Like, do you want to talk to me about something? Can I help you? You know, and more people come forward and they're like, I'm struggling or I did this and I don't know if it's this anymore. Or I went through the same thing. It was just on the DL. Everybody right. in your department has been through that shit. They just yeah. don't talk about it. because yeah, Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not, and it sucks for women, right? Because we're supposed to be, they call me an alpha female. I don't know if I am or not, but you have to be one of the men. And I, I've been a tomboy my whole life, so it's not that hard. But you have an expectation as a woman in this job to be, you know, you're doing a man's job, whether women want to hear it or not. It's the truth. You know, we have to be, we can't compare ourselves to them on that level though, because they'll hide shit all day long. We know they're men. That's what they do. No offense. No, it's okay. No. We, we dwell on things. It, it, you know, it's just something that we do. And I think that's what affects us more, but we don't talk about it because, Oh God forbid, we're a woman doing a man's job and now we can't take a scene of a dead child that we couldn't save. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to be called a punk for that. You know, yeah. put all that aside a minute because any person that was on that scene with me probably would have had to take a minute because it was absolutely horrible and yeah. wasn't the first one. It was just that specific one for some reason. And I think it was seeing so many of them, just that one. It's like light a match, man. You just lit it, oh. all, lit it all on fire. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just, I don't really know what to say, except don't be afraid to reach out. I mean, right. if you even think, you know, or even if you don't think something's going on and you were like, Oh, I had this really bad domestic or I had this really bad accident and I haven't been able to sleep or eat. You need to talk to somebody because that's, right. where, it that's where it's going to start. Right. Noticing the symptoms. Yeah. Even just calling us or confiding in a partner but nowadays you can't trust people on this job you're one man show half the time they're gonna stab you in the back the minute you walk out the door now i'm thinking well, i don't have that but there are a lot of places yeah yeah because we've shared about that as well and i again i have a lot of things that i'm envious about your departments and the way that they've worked with you but like any anywhere in the united states or anywhere in the world when you're in police work um this is a dog eat dog absolutely and uh some of the best detectives i ever worked with were uh, were women and i always i always like i don't know maybe it's my mom raised me most of the time anyway so maybe i'm just biased to the fact that i think uh that women can do our job and do it very well and in some cases like in what you talked about where you were the one on certain calls to where you took your vest off to have this conversation and got down to their level we're always trying to be so tough but if more of us would get in touch with our more sensitive sides right like i've never been ashamed of my sensitive side because to me it's made me more passionate it's made me more caring and again, that's why I'm here having this conversation. That right. stigma, though, is a killer. I'm telling you, uh, I agree with you on uh, the most important thing is to is to when you feel it coming on, especially in the beginning, you know, and it, I think it's changed now for 2020. And you're a great example of how departments will work with you if you have a good working relationship. If you're a good cop like you are, they're going to work with you. If you're not a good cop, they're going to find a, a way to weed you out. And you are alpha. Trust me. You, uh, you're, I've gotten to know you quite well. And whether you like it or not, your posts are very inspiring. And seriously, yeah. that's just the way yeah. it is. You know, um, I'm, I'm envious in a lot of ways because of your boyfriend as well. Because no, Don't be his ego, please. No, no. Oh, well, it's true. Yeah. Because seriously, I... Uh, I used to be able to do work out and try to take care of myself better. I'm not saying I can't. I'm just saying that when I ended up physically sick uh, and I, I had to start uh, my, I don't care. This is a pie. Who cares of what I admit, but I had to start taking testosterone. Yeah. And I'd never, I didn't know that my levels were down to like that of a 90 year old man. Yeah. So I'm like, why am I exhausted all the time? Why am I not like feeling energetic? Right. Right. Well, I used to work out and do fine, but now it's I'm on that hor is it a hormone 
treatment, replacement, whatever. I don't know. Listen, people think I'm on steroids and him, and we don't do any of that. So, no, so I, dude, I, I could tell you guys know, <laughs> but that's yeah. the thing though, but you're working out, you're taking care of yourself. You stopped. And after noticing your symptoms, even if it was a few months, because I'm sure it was probably over a period of time with the divorce and everything else. And, um, that you, you acknowledged it, you reached out and you, you, and where fate comes in is you reached out to me after you couldn't get anyone right. and you became a part of the mission to help people just like me. And the only thing I I've apologized to all of you guys, because what happens with me is when I get physically sick and something happens, it slows the whole freaking process down yeah. instead of just letting go and saying, Hey, Brandy or Nick, or you guys just take the reins. It's like, it's like my baby. I want to make sure I'm there for everyone, but it's been a little quieter with the organization because of COVID. And now that there's uh telehealth and stuff, a lot of people are doing through telehealth. So like you did with, through us. So we have a, we have a counselor, a couple counselors now and instead of going out and getting the help or whatever, you can do it through your, in your bedroom. Yeah. You can have this conversation with a counselor like this, but it takes you acknowledging you're in that situation and also uh, reaching out what you've done. So you're a lot stronger. You're, you're the cop of the future. You're like, when I, when I see you and I see your attitude and your, the way you are like like you're going to go so far in this profession and are going to make a big impact if you already have it on so many people's lives if you stay the course you can't stop you got to always continue uh and if if you find that you don't have the ability to uh do what you got to do you got to reach out right. you know what i mean so yeah. you know we all have these things but I'd have been honored to work with you. Oh my God. We'd work cases together. We probably got in trouble though, because we're shit magnets. Yeah. You're a pit bull. I'm piss and vinegar. And I just, you know, I don't if people ask me, would I go back? Of course, I'd always go back. But now with my issues and you know, there's none right. going back. But um, one more thing, Brainy, because I know that we're pushing time frame here. Um, and like I told you guys who are listening in the blue family. Brandy Perchinski as a police officer uh, from Pennsylvania is also um, part of our uh, peer support with uh, first responders, PTSD connection. If you, um, if someone wants to reach out to you, you know, maybe wants to maybe interview you or has a questions or, or something, how can they get in touch with you? Of course, not your telephone number, but no. like, uh, I mean, I have Facebook, but Instagram, I think that's the, the everybody uses Instagram now. I mean, you can yeah. see, you know, but it is private. So you'd have to send me a message or something, but it's just Brandy Perchinski, I believe is my Instagram name. It's not hard. Yeah, yeah and, I think so. And if you, you're not sure which one, just look for the very uh, athletic, amazing posts. Looks like artists, yeah. her and her boyfriend, both like yeah. they <laughs> enjoy working out and posting inspirational stuff, making me sit in my little chair, eat my Twinkies going, hey. I wish. No, I eat Twinkies too. We, yeah. we upgraded our home gym. So, well, well yeah, as long as you're working out, you got to burn those calories. Yeah. Oh, I'm that's like, what I said, this is like 600 yeah. pounds if you didn't lift them. Like, at least I don't look like you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But they exactly. make fun of me all the time because I eat healthy, but I have a cookie or something. And I'm like, oh, it's, I've got snack. Quit. Yeah. They're the ones getting into my food because I bring all the good shit. Yeah, right? exactly. And, and make them Alfredo, homemade Alfredo. And they're like, oh, then they bust my ass. I'm like, no, I told no. you I was jealous of him. Stop yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you want to give out your, um, do you know your um, organization email? I do, but you know what? I haven't gotten one email, and if you've ever sent them to me, never got them because I um, have it on here, but it just keeps saying like a verification thing. Okay, I'll work on that as well. And if uh, if I'm able to fix it before this podcast comes out, guys, I will include it right here. Yeah, and but I got if, an iPhone, and I don't even know how to use the damn thing. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't tell you. I'm I'm Android. I I wanted to go to iPhone, but I'm too scared to transfer. It's the stigma. Yeah, I did. Uh, it. Apple, good for you. Yeah. Um, is there anything else 
that you want to share anything going on that you um, are working on or uh, when are you writing a book? I wish I'm actually reading a book. It's called spy the lie. It's amazing. It's about a uh, human, de you know, deception behavior. It's awesome. Um, but I don't really know. I mean, I'm helping, you know, a person now he's not even law enforcement. I just reached out to him. It, sometimes it takes us too, you know? Yeah, that's true. But if people don't bite off on it, you know, they're yeah. not, gonna, they're not going to do it. And and I want to say one thing too. I'm, I don't know about everybody else that comes on here, but I'm not medicated. Uh, I don't go to therapy. Your therapist isn't going to push medication on you. That's the last thing they want to do is medicate you. So don't feel like you're going to go to therapy and get Xanax or something. Cause it does. Yeah. It doesn't work. Everybody's afraid of that. And they think that, yeah. um, that's a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. But yeah, if you good. don't, it's hard to say because I don't want them not to talk to us. But if you don't want to and you want to exhaust all outlets like I did, kind of, start with physical fitness, man. I started physical fitness and I started running and I still run. I love it. Um, I don't do as much as I should. But I started running because it exhausted my mind so much I'd stop thinking about everybody it. tells me that yeah, and my body would get tired you know right. but you don't have time to worry right and i was so amped up i mean i'm always like this my partner says i like naturally produce meth in my body <laughs> but i used to be more so wound up because right. i'm constantly on the go i never rested i never did anything for myself it was for everybody else and i stopped doing that shit but I'm telling you physical fitness and, and the weightlifting is what I love the most now, but right. I started with running, but as long as you're trying something, right. Writing is a great therapy. It is. Uh, getting on about a book. social media is another one. Taking breaks from social media yeah. is huge. Oh my God. I, mean, I, I filter all my stuff in Instagram. I mean, it's so positive to me. I, I've never had anything bad on there. Um, but even just, reading like doing something for yourself like i paint you know um shooting guns stuff like that but don't think you know if you talk to us that you're we're not going to like put you in therapy and put you in a nut ward <laughs> yeah it doesn't it doesn't work that way at all oh, yeah and, you know joe you and i have conversations just on the phone while i'm on duty you know for like 50 minutes or more whenever i'm in between calls you know that's all it is and that's right. like i'm helping now he's not even law enforcement i checked in on him twice a week if I, you know, if I remember because I have another guy, but he's getting medication because he's at that level where he needs to be that way. Yeah, and that's fine. If you need that lifeboat at that time, then that's what you do. Doing great. Sleeping now. He's eating. Yeah. Oh, and I recommend magnesium. I take that after like a crazy shift and I can't sleep when I get home. It's a, it's a vitamin. Works for you. Magnesium. Oh, yeah. Magnesium 400 milligram helps me. It just relaxes everything. Um, I try, I use, I used to, I usually go to crack. I mean, it just straight, yeah. let's go right to crack. People say it helps. It's like, yeah, right. enough, yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm just saying, it's not like we're going to put you on medication and, and send you off to that ward or anything. Right. Or, or tell anybody. Um, I don't, yeah, I, don't care just, I want people to know that there's somebody out there in my area that struggled because I know they are too. Um, right. And they do reach out. I mean, it's like opening a door, man, and it's open forever. It's a revolving door at that point. Once you open that door, you're like, "That's so -and -so very true." Cool. So and so did this, and so and so did it yeah. too. I didn't even know my detective, who I talked about previously, was in therapy and had PTSD. Yeah, see what no I mean? clue. But no you clue. open that door. But he acknowledged it in me because he was seeing himself in me, right? But that's the only way I knew. He's. Right. I spend a lot of time with it. He never once shared that with me. Not That's one awesome. time. That's so, sad. It's sad, but it's awesome because. I'm just saying. I mean, I just. But don't, it took you though. See, I think people naturally do talk to you though. I think there's something again. There's something with you on that. As long as you're getting help for yourself and it stays continuous until, I don't know what it takes. Uh, again, no one. We're not going to be healed overnight. It's yeah. not like all of a sudden I'm. Uh, everyone knows I'm medically retired now, so it's not like I'm going back on duty or anything. But uh, it's it's just a life thing. It's a work in progress. It's you no know, to me. It's like with Brainy working out and doing her exercises. I work out by by staying focused on this mission to help others, and still, you know, if I didn't have the physical issues that that occasionally kick my ass uh i'd be doing a lot more be getting out a lot more but those are all excuses because i can still do that so um listen and just oh, another no, thing they know trauma like i said before 
and I, this is like, I feel like I'm at work right now when I'm doing an interview. Trauma is trauma. Don't be ashamed of it. Right. And don't hide it and don't allow it to affect your children. Um, Especially and, as a parent. Oh my yeah. God. And that, that was difficult for me. Not that I let it, but I couldn't even watch my, <sighs> but what I'm saying is anybody who's listening to this or whoever listens to it or wants to, that thinks that their trauma isn't worthy enough to be talked about. That's bullshit. Yeah. Um, everybody goes through things, even as a child. And even if that's the case, reach out. That's how I look at it. I mean, I have people talk to me about stuff, like I said, they're not even law enforcement. And they feel the same way. Um, but trauma is trauma. And you, can, I'm sorry, he's dying up here to be helped. You just got a million views. Yeah. But yeah, Henry. That cat is adorable. Put it up to the camera just so like oh, oh, my funny. God. Yeah. I had a Himalayan Persian. He's just a Himalayan. I have four. I have a Persian. Up. I have that cat is adorable. How bad is the shedding though? Not too bad. He just always is on me all the time. And listen, when I was, <laughs> when I was going through everything, he slept with me every night. And that was something oh, that's that adorable. I've never, he's never done. But anyway, I just want people to know that trauma is trauma. No matter if you're a cop, that's right. a veteran, if you're a nurse, doctor, teacher, whatever. Yeah. All, the, all on the front line right now. Out because guess what? It all leads to one thing at the end. And it's either suicide or help. Right. So that's how I look at it. I don't know. That's all I got to say about that. No, that's that's awesome. And that's why, that's literally why I wanted Brandy to come on to have this conversation with you guys. And, and we're going to try to do this on a more frequent basis. Um, you know, and it's up to you guys. If you're watching this, if you, if you like this and you want to see more of this, please hit like and subscribe. And, the, hit the bell icon, as they say. I'm learning all this logo. Hit the bell I icon to get notifications. That's dude. my daughter. She'll tell you. Smash yeah, exactly. Smash the, yeah, exactly. But, guys, last thing I will say, and it's so important. Yes, I have an organization that helps first responders. But even if you don't reach out to us, reach out to someone. I don't care if it's your family member, a pastor, the the minute you make that step forward and reach out for help will change everything for the better in my opinion uh it doesn't have to be through our organization there are others i won't personally name them just because there's a few that i would not recommend but you know you have to make that decision yourself you have to you know your decisions um are very important and you want it to be your decision I don't, you know, Brandy and I aren't going to force it on you, like she said. So this has been an amazing podcast, the Righteous Responders podcast. This has been episode eight with Brandy Perchinski, my sister. <laughs> so, uh, guys, we're going to let you go, and, and hopefully you'll have a good night, good day, good morning, whatever time it is for you. And Merry Christmas if we don't see oh, you. Oh, yeah, and Merry Christmas. Not happy holidays. Sorry yeah. for those. I hate to say it, but Merry Christmas. Yeah. So we'll talk to you guys real soon. All right. God bless. That's my favorite.